that's that's what would happen in the real world. Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to the channel. Or if you're new here, we do videos on creepy and disturbing things here. If you missed the several announcements, I have a second channel now for scary stories. Those scary story series I started on this channel, I created a separate channel for just listener scary stories. So a lot of people say they've been liking to listen to it as a podcast. A lot of people said that they like drawing or doing art or crafts and stuff with it. And so if you're interested in that, if you like low brain power content, content that's just stories people submitted to me and me reading and reacting to it. That channel will also be linked in the description. Okay, let's get into this absolute horrific story. So today we are talking about a YouTuber named Stephen McCullough who allegedly murdered a woman named Natalie McNally. He's being accused of that. He is currently awaiting trial for that. I am sorry for the protective language used in this video, but of course, as a blanket statement, everything here is alleged. He has not been convicted of this crime and everybody in the eyes of the legal system is innocent until proven guilty. So Stephen McCullough is known as Vote Saxon 07 on YouTube, which I believe is a reference to Doctor Who, which will make sense here in a minute. But this isn't actually his only channel. He had another channel called Vote Vote Saxon 07, The Archive, his original channel where he started posting on April 5th, 2010. His first video was entitled 11th Doctor's Sonic Screwdriver Toy Review, setting a tone for all of the content Stephen would be making going forward. Hello, YouTube viewers and random Doctor Who fans. He continued to make primarily Doctor Who content, and a lot of that was Doctor Who toy reviews specifically. However, he did branch into doing reviews of other toys on his channel as well. On January 19th, 2021, Stephen made a two-minute pretty cringe video on his original channel to let his viewers know that he was making this into an archive channel. He would be making a new second channel for all his new content. He said the reason for the switch was to make better quality videos, which as you'll see, the quality never really got that much better, but also how his old channel had a lot of copyright issues and he wanted to just start anew. Like I said, this video is a good representation of just how cringe and not funny Steven is, but Clearly, he thinks he is. No new videos will be uploaded to this channel. Instead, the fun continues over on Vote Saxon 07, a new channel created back in 2015 that isn't horribly beset by terrible copyright issues. Yet. The content on his new channel, his current channel, is more or less the same, heavy on Doctor Who reviews as well as other collectible toy reviews. Well, of course, there's nothing wrong with this topic. In fact, I think that adults collecting toys and collectibles is actually a really cool hobby. Steven, just like objectively speaking, was not a very great or particularly unique, talented content creator. Now, obviously, I'm not one to talk. It's not like my videos are Nexpo level editing. But I'm just saying, Steven had been posting on his YouTube channels consistently, fairly consistently, for 13 years and made almost a thousand videos between the two channels. And it showed because after 13 years of making video and still uploading to the present day, well, up until he got arrested, he only had about 37,000 subscribers. Now, again, I'm not dogging on content creators if they don't make the best quality videos. In fact, I prefer myself the less produced videos. When I go to YouTube, I want to watch YouTube. I don't need to see an IMAX movie. And I'm also not saying there's anything wrong with having a lower subscriber base or just doing it as a hobby just because you enjoy content creation. Like, I just want people to know small YouTubers out there, absolutely no hate to you. I was a small YouTuber for a very long time. I'm just saying it was very clear that Steven wanted to be a YouTuber. He wanted that to be his life. Like he was putting effort into trying to grow and he just never did. His thumbnails never really evolved or improved and he just couldn't quite get there. The irony in this, of course, is that he is now very famous, but for an entire 
entirely different reason. Another thing to note about Stephen's life, and this isn't very relevant to the story, but I think worth noting that during his time making videos, he did take a couple breaks because he lost both of his parents in a very short amount of time. In 2014, his mother passes away, and in 2015 then, the next year, his father passes away. I could not find a cause of death for his mom. I did find his dad's obituary. It's public and it seemed to imply that it was natural causes. This does not excuse Stephen's alleged actions, but it is just admittedly extremely sad. But what I think is even more sad is that if he is in fact guilty, this is the legacy that he left for his parents. Like. You think his parents would be proud. Then we have our victim, Natalie McNally. Natalie and Steven had been dating since reportedly August of that year, 2022. So this all just went down last year. According to Natalie's family, she was a fun-loving, beautiful person. She lived with type 1 diabetes, which as we know, cannot be easy and didn't let it stop her from living her life. She worked in marketing at a company called TransLink. She loved animals and music. She was the only girl in her siblings. She had three brothers, Niall, Brandon, and Declan. Her parents' names are Bernadette and Noel. Her family called her Nats as a nickname. She had a lot of friends. She was well-liked and she would reportedly do anything for her friends, her family, and of course her pets as well. She lived in Lurgan, Northern Ireland, and the townhouse property she lived at was called Silverwood Green. She was 15 weeks pregnant at the time of her death with a baby boy that she planned to name Dean. It would have been Bernadette and Noel's first grandchild. And it was in fact confirmed that this baby was biologically Stevens. So Natalie McNally was found murdered brutally in her town home, supposedly by Stephen on December 19th, 2022. Stephen claimed that he went to Natalie's place when he couldn't get a hold of her. And when he arrived, he found her deceased. Stephen called emergency services and the police and paramedics, just in case she was still alive, arrived at the scene around 10 p.m. on December 19th, which was a Monday. Paramedics were not needed as it was clear Natalie was long deceased. Now, the following details are very disturbing. It was clear that Natalie had been stabbed many times, but it wasn't just a stabbing. They also found that she had compression wounds on her neck. That means somebody tried to strangle her. And she also had evidence of blunt force trauma to her head. However, I believe the official cause of death was from the stabbing and some of the stab wounds were defensive, meaning that Natalie fought for her life. Her father, Noel, had to later identify and confirm that it was her body, and he said that he couldn't even recognize her. The wounds were so bad. Now, at the crime scene, police did find the knife that was used to stab Natalie, but oddly enough, they did not find the object, whatever object was used, that caused the trauma to her head. Now, as Natalie's boyfriend at the time and the one who found her body, Stephen was immediately arrested pretty much as a precaution. I mean, just statistically speaking, it's the romantic partner that is most often the perpetrator. However, when Stephen was questioned, he told police that he had nothing to do with Natalie's murder. He tried to tip them off to somebody else, explaining that he believed it was one of Natalie's ex-boyfriends who had recently been coming back around and harassing her. It was not him because he was completely devastated that the love of his life was gone. And he said that he could prove this to the police. He told them that he had an alibi. He couldn't possibly have been the one who murdered Natalie because he was at home live streaming on YouTube the night before for six hours. The entire timeline in which Natalie was likely killed, he was live streaming. And there was proof that he was live sitting at his desk live streaming and was nowhere near Natalie's townhome. This was a rock solid alibi, you have to admit. Police found the live stream of Stephen, confirmed that because of that, it wasn't possible that he was at Natalie's house the night before and he was let go. And on December 24th, Christmas Eve last year, Stephen was officially cleared as a suspect. 
verdict. Because of this, Natalie's parents then believed that he was innocent, that he was live streaming that night and he couldn't possibly be responsible for this. And so this detail is terrible. Um, And so on Christmas Day, they allowed Stephen to visit Natalie's body. I assume she was embalmed. She did have a casket at her funeral. And they allowed Stephen to go and visit her body to mourn over her. And he spent 20 minutes with her body alone. So if Stephen didn't do it, police are wondering who did. They had to find who the murderer was, and so the investigation was on. Police run through Natalie's day on December 18th, step by step, hoping to paint a picture. The World Cup was on on December 18th, and so Natalie spent most of the day at her parents' house watching the football game with them. Later, she then drove home in her own car and arrived at her townhouse at about 7 p.m. There is CCTV footage of her coming home. On her phone, police found text messages between her and Stephen. Stephen told Natalie that he would be live streaming Grand Theft Auto on YouTube all night, leading her to believe that they were not going to hang out. At around 4 p.m., Stephen had also announced the stream on his Twitter account and said that the stream would be from about 6 p.m. to the rest of the night. Right before the stream started at 5.57 p.m., he even texted Natalie, right, I'm off to stream the night away. Wish me luck. And again, at this point, as far as police are concerned, Stephen was live streaming the night that Natalie was murdered. With her boyfriend busy, Natalie being at her parents all day, she settled down for a nice quiet night at home alone with her German Shepherd dog and her two cats. Police soon strike another very strong lead. They're looking at CCTV footage in the area of Natalie's building and they uncover CCTV footage on December 18th, 2022, the night she was killed. At 8.52 p.m., a man with a rucksack is seen entering the building He appears to have white shoes on, but he's wearing a hood and a scarf to cover his face. Then at 9.31 p.m. the same night, less than 40 minutes later, CCTV shows the same man leaving the building. He had changed his outfit and now had a black backpack over his shoulder. Obviously believing this was their guy, the police started checking other CCTV in the area. They see the same man hooded, wearing a scarf and gloves approaching a bus stop at about 7.09 p.m., two miles from Natalie's home. There's, of course, cameras on the bus, which films this same man boarding the bus. He pays in cash, but he drops some coins because of his gloves. Unable to pick them up because his black gloves were too thick, the man finally relents and takes them off so he can retrieve the fallen coins. Investigators notice that this man under his black gloves is wearing yellow latex gloves. So he was double gloved and made sure to wear latex gloves underneath. And police study the figure and it appears to be the same person who enters and leaves Natalie's building. Police know that whoever killed Natalie must have been someone that she knew. The first clue for this was that there was no signs of a break-in and the neighbors did not hear any noise and didn't hear the German shepherd bark, which if it was a stranger, the German shepherd definitely would have protected Natalie. If you don't know, German shepherds are, you know, known as police dogs. Like they're very loyal to their human. Anyway, that just proves that whoever this was, Natalie let them in willingly and she was obviously comfortable with them and trusted him. However, around 9 p.m. that night, neighbors would later report that they did hear a woman scream. As the man is seen on CCTV footage going into her building at 8.52 p.m., this would make sense and go with the timeline. It is believed that that is when Natalie was attacked or if not killed. This man was obviously trying to cover their tracks. As we talked about, they were wearing gloves, double gloves to make sure to not leave any fingerprints. They changed outfits afterwards and was carrying a backpack. No doubt had evidence inside as obviously they couldn't just go take a taxi home with bloodstains 
all over them and also trying to conceal their face, which may suggest that this person possibly knew that there might be CCTV footage around or didn't want anyone in the area to recognize or witness that he was in the area. So then investigators figure out that whoever left the building at 9.31 p.m. found a taxi by chance around the corner. The taxi was waiting on somebody else, but the man got in and convinced the taxi to take him instead, saying that his mother was ill and that he needed help getting a ride to her place to go and care for her and the taxi driver agreed. The taxi drove this man back to his home, dropped him off. The man got out of the cab, ran in really quick to get money to pay the fare. He then pulled two bags out of the taxi and threw them over the hedges into his yard. He returned home at exactly 11.13 p.m. So it's January at this point. Police are obviously working very hard to investigate and try to solve this case. Several other people other than Stephen, a couple other men were arrested briefly and questioned, but they were cleared of all suspicion and were released. Police end up going back to the drawing board and back to Stephen. They just couldn't shake the feeling that it was all too convenient that Stephen was live streaming in the exact hours that Natalie was murdered. Stephen was then texting her that night to make sure that she knew he was live streaming and then proceeded to be the first one who found her the next day. So statistically speaking, as we said, it's It's always the husband is what they say, right? It's always a spouse or a romantic partner that is typically most likely the perpetrator. And just statistically speaking, Stephen was the most likely suspect. But even more staggering, if you didn't know, homicide by an intimate partner is the leading cause of death for pregnant and postpartum women. Let that sink in for a second. It is more likely that a pregnant woman will be killed by their spouse or partner than by a complication from birth or pregnancy. That is a staggering, frightening statistic. That scares the crap out of me. That is so scary that women that are already in a shady situation, their risk after getting pregnant of being harmed just shoots up. And of course, it just says something huge about violence against women. Anyway, police brought Stephen back up as someone to look into. Investigators went back to watch Stephen's live stream again, his alibi. He was live streaming conveniently again for six hours in the exact same hours that Natalie was murdered. And then they noticed something odd about the live stream. During the live stream, Stephen continuously reminded viewers that he was really sorry, but he couldn't interact or read the live stream chat for that stream because he was having technical issues and it would make his computer crash. Yeah, so what are we doing tonight? Well, because this streaming software is kind of up the left, it means I can't check the live chat. Which is a real shame. So, by all means, talk amongst yourselves. I could use my phone to dip in every now and again and uh, check it, but I've decided that I kind of hate live streams where people just sit and read comments and go, Oh my god, yes, ask me questions better. Um, And also, if I go on my phone for too long, I'll end up just scrolling through TikTok and the amount of time that I've lost scrolling through TikTok is unbelievable. So, yeah. Phones away, can't look at the live chat for some bloody reason because if I do it makes the whole thing freeze and OBS just screws up. Uh, In fact, I am, I'm still live. Good. (laughs) Right, yeah, so um, I need to get my anxiety about whether or not the stream will crash just out of the way, otherwise it'll affect the whole bloody thing. But yes, um, if you have questions, comments, opinions, anything like that, tough. (laughs) This makes absolutely no sense. Now, I know a lot of millennial Gen Z understand this concept, but for those of you that aren't on the internet that much or don't know, there is no conceivable way that somebody could be live streaming and just everything else is going well, all their tech is on, their computer's working smoothly, the Wi-Fi's working, the stream's working smoothly, but just their live chat would make their computer crash. Just their live chat 
isn't working. They couldn't read the live chat. That makes absolutely no sense. If that was true, you wouldn't be able to live stream. So the cyber experts that were helping investigate this figured out and proved for a fact that the stream was pre-recorded. Steven, as it turns out, recorded this stream days ago and then posted it to YouTube during the time that Natalie was murdered in her home. Now, also for those of you not familiar with live streaming, you can post a pre-recorded video to the platform. This is how a lot of lo-fi channels do it or ambiance channels do it. There's um, a lot of people that live stream study sessions, but sometimes they're pre-recorded and they play them as if they are live. It's totally possible to do so that the creator doesn't actually have to be in the room, but can still put on a live stream. Most people know that they're not actually there. And in those cases, the creator is not interacting with the chat. It's also how creators can run live streams for days, weeks, months at a time. And then they found out, remember the taxi? The taxi that took the mysterious man from the CCTV footage home that night. Well, taxis have GPS systems. <laughs> Investigators figured out which taxi was running that night in that area. And the taxi has GPS information. It can tell you where the taxi drops off at certain times. So we know he got home at 1113 p.m. because the taxi's GPS was at Stephen's home at 11.13 p.m. Later, that taxi driver would confirm in a lineup that Stephen was the one he drove home that night. Now, that's important to note, but take it with a grain of salt as the taxi driver did admit to having seen Stephen's face in the media, which could have swayed his recognition of him. But regardless, the taxi driver does claim that that is the same person. I think the GPS info is more compelling. The other piece, it was really hard to find actual forensic evidence linked to this case. The one source I read that talked about the gloves said that they did find a like micro tiny fiber strand piece of his yellow glove of the yellow latex gloves in Natalie's home. Of course, this was a microscopic piece and that didn't connect directly to Stephen, but connected to the person on CCTV. Anyway, police determined they have enough evidence against Stephen. And on January 31st, 2023, they arrest him again. They read him his rights and they bring him in and they start questioning him again. Police tell Stephen that, hey, man, we know that your live stream was pre-recorded. Upon learning this, Steven immediately changes his story. He says that, oh yeah, I did record the live stream five days before I actually posted it, but that's because I wanted to stream that night, but I wanted it to just play so that I could just drink and hang out for the night by myself. So then since he's under arrest, I don't know if police got a warrant. I assume that they did, or Steven thought that they would never get anything. So he handed over his phone. I don't know. Either way, police looked at his phone and remember how whoever got out of that taxi at Stephen's property at 1113 PM. Well, after hours of inactivity, his phone had not been touched for hours. They found on the back end of his phone that it was suddenly active again at 1116 p.m. three minutes after this man got out of the taxi. Stephen had an answer prepared for this as well. He said, like I said, I was drinking all night while my pre-recorded stream was going. Because I was drinking, I fell asleep for a few hours. When I woke up, I must have opened my phone again at 11.16 p.m. and I took the garbage out at that time as well. He also admits that, oh yeah, around that time there was a cab that pulled up to my property around that time, but it wasn't me, it was somebody else. And uh, here's a few, and he named a few people that it could have been who were dropped off in the area at that time. Steven, not looking good for you there, buddy. So that's all pretty incriminating, but get this detail. This is bananas. So Steven was, of course, trying to make himself seem very innocent. He wanted to play up the grieving partner after Natalie was killed. And so he stayed in close contact with Natalie's parents. He frequently went over to their house 
which I cannot imagine how Natalie's poor parents feel now. But Stephen also attended her vigil, but also attended a rally that Natalie's family put on to protest violence against women and to get justice for Natalie. There's a photo of him attending and wearing the pins and stuff like that. If that doesn't give you chills, I don't know what will. It makes me sick thinking about the fact that he was there. I'm not surprised that he was there. Like, obviously, again, if he is guilty of all these accusations, of course he's going to do this. Of course he's going to stay in contact with the parents and pretend like he's sad and mourning. It would be really weird. It would look very suspicious if he didn't attend the rally and the vigil. You know what I mean? So that does make sense, but it still just makes me sick to think that the audacity and the confidence, the hubris it takes to attend and pretend like you're grieving. The other thing that gives me chills is just like what he probably said to Natalie's body, or at least the thoughts he was thinking when her parents let him spend 20 minutes alone with her after she died. I just, I can't, I... The parents are already going through the most horrific thing you can possibly go through. Just imagine who they now believe is their daughter's killer was what, like, thinking back on all his behavior until that point is just sickening. Anyway, okay, that's not the bananas part. So he attended all of those things and he was staying close with the parents. One time when he visits Natalie's parents about a week before he's arrested, he forgot his phone, allegedly forgot his phone at Natalie's parents' house and he left it on recording. So he was trying to record them and recorded them for 40 minutes before he came back and got his phone. And the prosecution claims that Stephen, of course, did this so that he could listen in on their conversation right after he left to see if he could keep tabs on the investigation, as well as to figure out if Natalie's parents were suspecting him at that time. Again, that's all alleged. It's alleged that he did that. But if he did do that, that makes me think that Stephen maybe was confident, but maybe not as confident as he would have liked to be, that maybe he was just a little worried. Stephen, of course, claims that leaving his phone on record at their house was an accident. Then on Stephen's phone, investigators also found strange Google searches that he made on November 12th, 2022, just a few weeks before Natalie was murdered. He Googled things like, quote, is it more painful to be shot in the head or the heart? And quote, which is less painful, drowning or burning to death? And would you rather drown or be shot? And is drowning a painful way to die? I want to stress these could be completely unrelated, especially because, again, if he did what is alleged, then he didn't end up killing Natalie in any of these methods. So it could be completely unrelated. But again, it was just another like little tick on the Stephen is creepy checklist. So with all of this mounting evidence and Stephen, of course, not helping investigators whatsoever, um, on February 2nd, a few days after being arrested for the second time, Stephen was formally charged with Natalie's murder. His defense tried to get him bail, of course, but the judge believed that Stephen could be a flight risk and she denied his bail. Thank God. Now, you might be asking a pretty obvious question, and I'm really sorry I haven't answered this yet, but we had to get all those other details out of the way first. Motive. Most people at this point are asking, why? Why did Stephen do this? The person he was supposed to care about above everybody else, and the mother of his unborn child, to not only allegedly murder her, but to do it in such a cold-hearted, brutal way. Well, investigators think they found their motive when they searched Natalie's phone. This is really the straw that broke the camel's back for investigators that Stephen was guilty in their eyes. Three days before Natalie was killed, Natalie had exchanged 33 WhatsApp messages with another man. We believe this was one of her ex-partners. It was clear that Stephen had suspected that she was cheating on him because on December 17th, the night before Natalie's murder, 
Natalie stayed over at Stephen's house. Between 12.22 a.m. and 9.54 a.m., so December 18th, but the very early morning hours, her phone had been unlocked nine times. And whoever unlocked her phone opened her WhatsApp and Twitter accounts, but did not send any messages. One of Natalie's family members confirmed that Natalie gave Stephen her password to her device in November. And again, allegedly, Stephen waited until Natalie was asleep to look through her phone, found messages between her and this other man, probably ex-boyfriend, and Stephen had all the proof that he needed. However, remember that just because he got confirmation on this night, allegedly, that doesn't mean that he had suddenly planned to kill her and put this whole plot in motion within a matter of a few hours. Because remember, the live stream was recorded five days before Natalie was murdered. And so if Stephen did this, he had been planning it before then, but for whatever reason, looked through her phone allegedly for confirmation. Okay, actually, just kidding. I do have one more soapbox moment. I will try to make it brief. But every time we have a domestic violence situation and uh, the motive seems to be cheating or perceived cheating or whatever, I always see comments on my videos or other videos blaming the victim for being killed because they were cheating. <sighs> no. Cheating sucks. Don't cheat on people. Break up with them if you're thinking about cheating with them. That sucks. Don't do that. That's not okay. That's not a respectful way to treat a partner. However, you should not get the death penalty for cheating on someone. That punishment does not fit the crime. And if I... I am so sick of people saying like, well, bitch did this, so she got what she deserved. She shouldn't have cheated on him. That's what happens when you cheat on people. Literally, no. Somebody cheating on you deserves to be broken up with. They maybe deserve to have their car keyed. And for legal purposes, that is a joke. But the thought that someone actually deserves to lose their life in a violent way because they cheated is just absolutely unhinged, absolutely inexcusable behavior. It's just gross. Like I said, cheating should not warrant the death penalty. Okay, so let's talk about the live stream a little bit because there are some really creepy things that happened in the live stream. Now, like I said, allegedly accused if Stephen is in fact guilty for doing this, which all the evidence seems to be pointing in that direction, in my opinion. If he's guilty, his live stream in hindsight is creepy as fuck. First of all, he titled the live stream Violent Night Christmas Live Gaming Stream, where he played Grand Theft Auto Vice City during the stream. That was a choice. That was obviously deliberate to pick such a name as a violent night on that night. But then during the stream itself, one of the creepiest moments of the stream was definitely this one. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's that's physics. That's that's what would happen in the real world. Absa fucking notly. Hmm. Absa fucking notly. The way that he smirks at the camera with like this knowing look is just unhinged and so disturbing. And then at another point, this. I need to kill this bitch. I need to take her down. Cause I won't pass the mission if I don't get this bitch to die. Tra la la. So then about midway through the stream, Steven takes a break. This makes sense. A lot of streamers do this, especially if they are streaming for many hours and he was streaming for six hours. So at about the three hour mark, he takes a little break. On screen for a brief moment, a James Bond poster appears with the title of the movie, No Time to Die.
Steven comes back and laughs it off and claims that that was just a mistake. I'll tell you something. I made a real pig's ear of that. <laughs> I just sat down and I pulled the controller and the headphones off the table, which had the keypad, which um, it's apparently hotkeys are still connected. So it, um, it went on to something else for a little second. Yeah, anyway, uh, I have returned. But remember, this is pre-recorded. It's not like he was responding to questions from the live chat asking him what the James Bond poster was about. He like specifically added in that comment. And I highly doubt it was a mistake at all because again, like we said, this was pre-recorded. No time to die at the exact time that Natalie was being killed. What's even creepier is that about three hours into his stream would have been about 9 o'clock p.m. when he was taking this break. So if he did this, it's almost like he timed it so that poster would be up right around 9 o'clock, right when she was being killed. I've seen a lot of comments online talking about how Steven was dropping clues and Easter eggs in this stream as if it was a Scooby-Doo mystery. And I have to agree. It shows again that Steven thought he was so smart and really thought he was going to get away with this. Thought he was smarter than police, allegedly. Fucking unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. So I thought you were supposed to like run him off the road and kill him, much like your woman. Thank you so much. I swear to God, see if, see if it fucking takes too long and this fucker gets away. I will kill you all with fire! Fucking hell! What does it take? What does it take? What the f*** is it f***ing dick? I'm spitting feathers. <laughs> I just realised I'm literally going to be drinking and driving. In the game, by the way, I'm, I'm not leaving the house tonight. So, um, yeah, in the game, I will be drunk while driving in the game. I'll be drunk in real life. I'll be driving in the game. Just, uh, just uh, keep myself in the, in the good books, shall we say? I did hit you, and I liked it. I don't know. I don't have too many loved ones in my life, but the ones I love, I love with all my heart. So, you know, at least I've got that going for me. So that's about it. As of now, this is an ongoing investigation. As we know, Stephen is in jail currently. He was denied bail and he is awaiting his trial. The most recent articles I could find said that they were getting ready to start setting a date for his trial. Him pleading not guilty is pretty wild to me. Like, I know that he's maintaining his innocence at this time, but I almost predict, like, I personally predict that at the last minute, he might be one of those that puts in an Alfred plea, which says they have too much evidence against him to win a trial, but he's not admitting guilt, or maybe change his plea and take a plea deal for guilty so that he gets a lesser punishment. I don't think the death penalty is a thing in Ireland. It's like in most uh, European countries, there's not the death penalty. I'll put it on the screen here to confirm though, but he will probably be facing life in prison without parole. I hope, I hope at the very least that's what he gets. So I'm kind of curious to know if he's going to change last minute and try to take a deal. That would not surprise me. Just because the evidence against him is pretty strong. I just have a hard time believing that his defense lawyer is going to say, yeah, jury's going to find you innocent. I don't know. Who knows? Oh, hey everyone, please like the video just to help the channel. If you're interested in more perks, exclusive videos, Netflix party, stuff like that, my Patreon is also linked down below and I will see you all in the next video. Thank you so much to all of our patrons on the screen right now. Top tiers are Colin Holmes, The Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Little Kittle Cat, Mitchell Schaefer Meyer, Momo Neon, Marita144, Elderly Hipster, Rebecca Jackson, Quinamon, Cobblecon Anime and Gaming Convention, Sarah the Crazy Fish Lady, Maxi, Ellison Luna, Tiny Mighty Bookworm, A Bunny Apparently, Leon Vanek, I Am In Your Walls, Habromania, Cyberdog Investigations LLC, Vicky Cat, Amy B, Take Urch, Dead Without the E, Chara, MH Dave, Ami, 
Lindsay R, It's Tara, obviously, Shayna R, El Magnificoco, Laura Winter, Lilith, Dana, Ashes, Gosh Zilla, Geo, Arya Anomaly, Ghosty Girl, Mel Miller, Jessica Cook, Mark Fagundes, and Mike. <laughs>